We have talked about them many times and we use them all the time. So we are so excited to officially be partnering with Moon Travel Guides. Seriously, we love Moon Travel Guides. If you were to look in the car while we were on our road trip this past summer, you would find at least five or six. If you've traveled the Americas, then you already know that Moon Travel Guides are the go-to guides for truly immersive experiences. With coverage of all 63 national parks and other outdoor adventures in every U.S. region, you can count on Moon's local expertise, unique recommendations, and strategic advice to help you plan an unforgettable trip, whether you're hiking in the heartland or camping on the coast. Wherever your wanderlust may lead, there's a Moon Guide for you. We have used so many Moon Travel Guides in our journeys, including the Moon Travel Guides for the 63 National Parks, Glacier National Park, Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks, Sequoia and Kings Canyon, Canyon National Parks, Acadia National Park, the Trails of the Northeast, and I've even used Moon Travel Guides while venturing through Canada. In addition to information about hikes and adventures in any given area, there's also great tips about local businesses, history, culture, and info for a diverse audience of travelers. And Moon Travel authors are real people who have a close connection to the places they write about. They aren't just experts on the area, they're members of that community. So whether you are taking a short road trip, exploring a new city, heading to a national park, or spending a week in the wilderness, make sure to pack a Moon Travel Guide with you. For more information and to purchase a Moon Travel Guide, be sure to visit moon.com. You have friends over, binge watching your favorite show, cats on your lap. No matter your reasons for wanting to stay put and keep your feet up, Get beer, wine, and spirits delivered to your door in under 60 minutes with Drizzly, the number one app for alcohol delivery. It's so convenient. You can shop across multiple stores, choose from a huge selection, and find the best deals on exactly what you're looking for. Get what you want and get it when you need it. Right now, Drizzly is giving all new customers $5 off their first order if you use the code FAST5. So download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's drizzly, D-R-I-Z-L-Y dot com and use the promo code FAST5 for $5 off your first order. Get what you want and get it when you need it with Drizzly. Today's episode of Gaze at the National Parks is sponsored by TrueFire.com, the planet's largest and most comprehensive selection of online guitar lessons, according to Guitar Player Magazine. TrueFire's interactive learning tools and massive library of over 50,000 video lessons help guitarists ignite their technical skills, harmonic knowledge, rhythm playing, and soloing. Over 2 million guitar players worldwide learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Using TrueFire's desktop and mobile app, Guitarists work with multi-angle HD video lessons on any device, anytime, anywhere, and at their own pace. TrueFire's style-specific learning paths guide guitarists every step of the way. Use the assessment tools to find your starting point, then follow the lesson recommendations and track your progress as you work through your personalized TrueFire study plan. And TrueFire's educators are the best in the biz. From Grammy Award winners to world-renowned artists, TrueFire students have access to an unparalleled faculty of over 300 top-notch blues, rock, jazz, country, and acoustic guitar educators. Guitar players can progress faster with private one-on-one instruction, group lessons, multi-track video jams, live streams, song lessons, premium tracks, and so much more. With thousands of five-star reviews from amateur and pro players alike, you'll find yourself in good company with the world's most comprehensive guitar learning platform. So grab your guitar and ignite your musicality. Visit TrueFire.com and use code GAZE for your free 30-day all-access trial and 50% off your first purchase. That's TrueFire.com slash GAZE. And that's GAZE, G-A-Z-E. 
Hello and welcome to Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. I'm Dusty. And I'm Mike. If you're joining us for the first time, Gaze at the National Parks is a podcast that explores the trails of America's national parks. One hiking trail and one national park, one park at a time. In between our full-length episodes, which explore these trails, we have trail mix episodes. These episodes cover a variety of topics related to the national parks and the environment, and often explore topics we didn't get to cover in depth in a full-length episode. Right now, our full-length episodes are all about the trails and Glacier National Park, located in the area of land also called Montana. We'd also like to acknowledge that the land, also known as Glacier National Park, is on the traditional and stolen land of the Blackfeet and the Tanaha Nation. Today's trail mix is all about the science of glaciers, the landmass and scientific process that inspired this park's name. Okay, so what do you already know about glaciers? Well, I know that glaciers are, for the most part, left over from the ice ages of, you know, yesteryear, (laughs) and that their retreat helped to carve land masses, leave gigantic lakes. The Great Lakes and the United States are remnants of glaciers. I also know that the debris field that's left once a glacier retreats is called a moraine. Great. Those are the things I know. Okay. Great. Well, let's start with the basics. What are glaciers and how are they formed? Glaciers are humongous masses of ice. They are formed when snow falls repeatedly in a concentrated area of land, and the snow builds up and compresses over time. There are glaciers in every continent of the Earth and are mostly found in cold or alpine climates. In order for glaciers to form, they must be in high snowfall areas and also remain cool in the summer. The amount of snow the area receives will depend on if the glacier grows, remains stable, or is what scientists call retreat, also known as getting smaller. If the snowfall in the winter is greater than what melts off in the summer, a glacier can grow or remain stabilized. However, if glacier melt is greater in the warmer months than the snowfall is in the colder months, the glacier will go into retreat. Glacier melt is one of the leading causes for glacier movement, or sliding. Sliding is common and most often happens when a thin layer of water forms at the base of a glacier, allowing it to move over rock and sediment. While compressed snow that experiences a similar process sometimes causes avalanches, glacier movement is slow and happens over hundreds and sometimes thousands of years. When a glacier forms, it is still susceptible to gravity. Gravity can cause the glacier to move and change shape. Sometimes glaciers can look like rivers of ice, and though glaciers are gigantic and frozen, their movement is powerful and impactful. The movement of a glacier has the power to leave a sustained impression. This is sometimes in the form of a valley, a river that becomes wider, or a carved out pocket on the side of a mountain. While the landscape physically changes with the movement of a glacier, there are other big benefits that come from glacial movement. Water from glaciers, also known as glacier melt, help deliver important nutrients to other bodies of water, including lakes, rivers, and even oceans. Specifically, the nutrients in glacier melt can help promote the blooming of phytoplankton, which is also the base of the marine life food chain. And in some parts of the world, communities depend on glacier melt for their water supply. When a glacier moves, it often takes things with it. Sometimes this includes rocks, boulders, and bits of earth. When these bits accumulate in one area and get left behind after glacier movement, this pile of rock debris is called moraine. Right. Okay, so where have we seen moraine before? So we've seen moraine on the hike, the Sai Pass hike. Yes. Um, also on the um, Scenic Point hike. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like we also saw moraine in Grand Teton. Yep. There was some moraine there. But I do remember quite a bit of moraine all over Glacier National Park. Mm-hmm. And it's so funny because they're so distinct in like what they're they bands. look like. That's like bands of stone, basically. Mm-hmm. And you can, and sometimes they're just like piles, mm-hmm. as if the glacier took a dump, <laughs> right? Or gravel company came in and just left a pile of the gravel, gravel. company took a dump, <laughs> right? Right in the spot where that moraine is. Mm-hmm. So yeah, sometimes moraine. I know it looks different depending on where it is and what the process was and how the glacier moved, but the ones we saw were more like the pilings, a dump. <laughs> Glaciers currently cover about 10% of the Earth's surface, as compared to the Ice Age when they covered about 32%. Currently, the glaciers on Earth also contain about 69% of the Earth's fresh water. Wow. Yeah. In the land also called the United States, there are about 35,000 square miles of glacial ice, most of it being contained inside the land also called Alaska, which contains about 34,000 of those square miles. 
Sometimes glaciers appear white, and sometimes they appear with a bluish tint. As snow compresses inside a glacier, ice crystals are made and air pockets form around them. As these air pockets get compressed, they are able to absorb only a small bit of red light, which reflects out a bluish tint. So if you see a glacier that has a bluish tint, that means many of the air pockets have been compressed. The largest area of glaciers in the land, also known as the Lower 48, is in Washington State. The glacier melt in this area provides about 480 billion gallons of water every summer. This water is used for drinking water, to irrigate crops, and for hydroelectric power. The largest glacier in the world is located in Antarctica and is about 250 miles long, 60 miles wide, and in some areas up to 3 miles thick. We have talked about them many times, and we use them all the time, so we are so excited to officially be partnering with Moon Travel Guides. Seriously, we love Moon Travel Guides. If you were to look in the car while we were on our road trip this past summer, you would find at least five or six. If you've traveled the Americas, then you already know that Moon Travel Guides are the go-to guides for truly immersive experiences. With coverage of all 63 national parks and other outdoor adventures in every U.S. region, you can count on Moon's local expertise, unique recommendations, and strategic advice to help you plan an unforgettable trip, whether you're hiking in the heartland or camping on the coast. Wherever your wanderlust may lead, there's a Moon Guide for you. We have used so many Moon Travel Guides in our journeys, including the Moon Travel Guides for the 63 National Parks, Glacier National Park, Yellowstone and Grand Teton National Parks, Sequoia and Kings Canyon, Canyon National Parks, Acadia National Park, the Trails of the Northeast, and I've even used Moon Travel Guides while venturing through Canada. In addition to information about hikes and adventures in any given area, there's also great tips about local businesses, history, culture, and info for a diverse audience of travelers. And Moon Travel authors are real people who have a close connection to the places they write about. They aren't just experts on the area, they're members of that community. So whether you are taking a short road trip, exploring a new city, heading to a national park, or spending a week in the wilderness, make sure to pack a Moon Travel Guide with you. For more information and to purchase a Moon Travel Guide, be sure to visit moon.com. Now let's talk about types of glaciers. There are so many. Let's start with ice sheets. These are gigantic and could be the size of a whole continent. Much of the northern area of the land, also called North America, was carved by this type of glacier in the last ice age. And when an ice sheet stretches over water, it can be known as an ice shelf. There are also ice fields and ice caps. They are similar to ice sheets, but they are under 50,000 square kilometers in size. There's also alpine glaciers or mountain glaciers, which means that they are formed in high alpine areas. If these alpine glaciers form inside a hollow bowl-shaped area, they are also called cirque glaciers. Speaking of mountains, let's talk about valley and Piedmont glaciers. These glaciers start very high in the mountains, so it's possible for them to start as an alpine glacier. But over time, if they move down the mountain and into a valley, or also help to carve a valley, then it's called a valley glacier. If this happens, but instead of a valley, the glacier spills out into an area of flatland, then it usually creates a round lobe-like shape, and it is called a Piedmont glacier. There is also tidewater and freshwater glaciers. These glaciers deposit glacier melt directly into bodies of water. Specifically, tidewater glaciers flow directly into an ocean in a coastal area. These are the types of glaciers that often have chunks break off to create icebergs. This is also known as calving. And finally, there are rock glaciers. These glaciers have a high concentration of rocks mixed into the compressed snow and ice. As they flow, the rocks continue to compress, and soon the rock and ice become one substance traveling together. Okay, so what glaciers did we see in Glacier National Park? So we were able to see Grinnell Glacier from two different vantage points, which was really cool. We didn't see Pegon Glacier like up close, but Becky pointed it out or where it used to be. I can't remember if it's one that's still there or was like it's remnants kind of small. Yeah. Yeah. And then we were able to get really close to Sexton Glacier, which was, I mean, I got closer than you did because I walked like along that moraine pile. Onto the moraine pile. And I, you were like, I was good. No, 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 no. I didn't need to go on the moraine pile. Um, But that was really cool. I mean, we weren't like able to touch it close. I think we could have 
I think we could have potentially hiked out there, but I also think it was probably going to be too much of a scramble to get back up and things we'll talk about in a future episode for sure. It's kind of wild, you know, the glaciers in that park, many of them are from not the long ago ice age, but like the mini ice age. Um, Right. So it's kind of wild to be like, wow, these have been around since, you know, the mid 1800s, right? The mid, no, mid the seven, mid 1400s. Mid 1400s. Just kind of thinking about that. And also the size, which is kind of wild because they're gigantic, but nowhere near as gigantic as they used to be. No, right. nowhere near as gigantic as yeah. they used to be. Technically, they'd be considered in retreat. Right. Yeah. In massive retreat, I think. Yes. Yeah. And all of the glaciers in Glacier National Park are considered what type? They are all considered rock glaciers. No, no. They're all considered calving glaciers. No, no. They no. are fry, no. freshwater tide water are glaciers. They mountain or they alpine glaciers. They are rock glaciers. Fold glaciers. No. <laughs> No, now you're getting your mountain types and your glacier types confused. (laughs) So many types. No, they are all mountain or alpine glaciers. That makes sense. Yeah, because they formed up there and they've just always stayed there. Yeah. So I'm sure some of them may be considered cirque because of like a circular Mm -hmm. pocket that they ended up in. But I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Since all of our episodes right now are about trails and the land also called Glacier National Park, let's talk about some other glaciers that you can see while you are there. One of the most... Oh, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) No, I think it works. Why don't you just take it? (laughs) Go for it. One of the most popular glaciers here is Grinnell Glacier, which can be seen by hiking the Grinnell Glacier Trail from Many Glacier. You don't actually have to hike the entire trail to see the glacier, but you will have to make it past the lakes and onto some incline a bit. Grinnell Glacier can also be seen from the Highline Trail, only if you hike the optional overlook. More of that in our Highline Trail episode. More on that in our Highline Trail episodes. There is also Jackson Glacier, which can be seen on the east side of going to the Sun Road. You can pull off and see it from the car. There is also Salamander Glacier, which can be seen from the car straight ahead while driving the road toward the mini glacier area. Sperry Glacier can be seen if you hike the Hidden Lake Trail at Logan Pass. If the sky is clear, then it is possible to see it in the distance over the peaks. It's also possible to hike it from Lake McDonald Lodge, though it is 8.5 miles one way with a 5,000 foot elevation gain. That sounds rough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) That's like an all day situation. Oh, that's like eat two dinners at the end of that. Yes, be a very long way. Mm -hmm. As we said before, there is also Sexton Glacier, which we got to see while hiking Sayi Pass. Um, And also visible from here is Pecan Glacier. Look at that. And finally, there are Vulture and Two Ocean Glaciers. These can be seen from the Highline Trail if you look out over the mountains on the other side of about two-thirds of the way through the trail if you are coming from Logan Pass. So there were quite a few other glaciers around us that we just didn't even notice. That we didn't notice or were were unaware of. There are, you know, uh, quite a few in Glacier National Park, but we did get up close to two. Uh, uh, yeah. We got up close to Grinnell. We were like yeah. right on top yeah. of it um, on that uh, Highline Trail yeah. um, offshoot trail. Yeah. Um, uh, which please listen to that. The Highline episodes when we tell you all about that offshoot trail. <laughs> um, they say so often that in Glacier National Park in particular, because they're all alpine glaciers, you kind of can't distinguish the difference between just like a snow field. A snow field and a glacier. Yeah. When looking from far away. I that mean, even sense. when looking up close, like we were pretty up close to Grinnell and Sexton and like they looked, they could totally be mistaken for snow fields. Sure. I think, I think the closer we got to both of them though, it made more sense that they were glacial. Um, oh, especially certainly. Sexton because you could kind of see the, the ridges and the sides of yes. it. Like the snow field was sort of like on the top of it. And like sort of down the side, but there was, I think, part of the the edges of the glacier were exposed there. So it was more apparent to me that that was a glacier at that point. Right. Than what it was from afar. Right. Yeah. Yeah. When we were up a little bit closer. Yeah. Yes. Apparently, there are quite a few glaciers Mm -hmm. that you can see just from going to the Sun Road or from the Highline Trail. Which we probably spied and just didn't even realize. And didn't even realize they were glaciers. I think I have photos of all of them. Probably. Didn't know they were glaciers. Glaciologists have been studying it. Don't you love that term? That's a great word. Glaciologist. 
Glaciologists have been studying glaciers, their movement patterns, and their impact for years. There are many reasons scientists have been studying glaciers for years. One reason is that glaciers are like keys to seeing the Earth hundreds and thousands of years ago. Snowflakes are porous and therefore contain everything that might have been in the air at the time it was falling. Studying glaciers helps us to know what the climate was like at different periods of time on the Earth's timeline. In 2018, the American Meteorological Society published their report called State of the Climate in 2018. I think we remember this report because like, it went around. <laughs> it's where my sadness comes from. Right, right. right. It was a report that looked at the Earth's climate from 1980 to 2018. Specifically regarding glaciers, they had reported that there had been a decrease in glacial mass since 1980. Specifically, and now quoting the report, quote, the equivalent of cutting a 24 meter thick slice off of the top of the average glacier, end quote. That's about 78 feet and 8 inches. And for some more perspective, if all glaciers were to melt, the sea level would rise by about 70 meters, also known as 230 feet. And that's worldwide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> just like, you know, when Mike starts his own podcast called My Dark Corner, <laughs> this can be, you know, first on the agenda to discuss. Good Lord. Yes. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. science, everybody. Mm -hmm. Here's the other thing is that it doesn't get it doesn't get much brighter. OK, since so many people still depend on glaciers as a resource for water, it is scary to think about what would happen if they were no longer intact or were no longer an available resource. And while glaciers have helped us understand the various periods of time in the Earth's timeline called ice ages, there's been much discussion about an impending mini ice age or little ice age. Based on science and research, the last mini ice age that occurred started at the beginning of the 14th century. Scientists believe for a long time that we may experience another little ice age around 2030. Many thought that this would help us in global warming. However, according to research reported from NASA, this is unlikely. In order to enter another little ice age, the sun's rays, which have a history of ranging in heat intensity, would need to be at what is called grand solar minimum. The last time the sun was producing at grand solar minimum, it corresponded with the little ice age. But the problem is the heat caused from burning fossil fuels. That heat is six times greater than the heat produced by the sun at grand solar minimum. There Therefore, even if the sun were at grand solar minimum, the burning of fossil fuels would still keep the Earth hotter than what it would need to be in order to usher in another little ice age. We. <laughs> <laughs> So, I know. Yes. And, and I think we actually are headed into um, grand solar minimum. Um, also, grand solar minimum sounds like it could be like um, like a video game that's car racing based. <laughs> right. <laughs> or but like you're a, racing around the universe. Right. Grand solar grand minimum. Grand solar minimum. Or grand or solar like maximum. A, or like a follow up to um, that movie with Mila Kunis and Channing Tatum where he was like an alien. It's like I have, Jupiter ascending, grand solar minimum. <laughs> I guess I don't need to I see think that, that movie was, now. I think that was horribly <laughs> panned. <laughs> so, um, There's a lot of people in that movie that had a big budget too. Oh, yeah. I think it was a big flop as oh, well. Oh, it, was, it um, was. But I do think we are actually at that period because I do remember reading a lot of articles like, oh, grand solar minimum is coming, mini ice age, and clearly that's right. not Right, but be not happening. if we're still burning fossil fuels, everybody. No. So... We... Let's end this trail mix with a game. <laughs> a game of despair. Okay, so Mike, I hope you were paying attention. Oh, God. Because this is... Um, For all you better know your glaciers. <laughs> so this category is called Identify the Type of Glacier Based on the Monologue in the Style of Tennessee Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, so Tennessee Williams mm -hmm. is a playwright. He wrote Cat on a Hot Tin Car Roof. Yes, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Streetcar Named Desire, mm -hmm. Glass Menagerie mm -hmm. were his big hits. He's known for Southern characters mm -hmm. who are dramatic and have beautiful flowering language mm -hmm. to express their feelings and emotions. Mm -hmm. So I will be reading all of these in mm -hmm. like a Southern dialect. So Glacier on a Hot Tin Roof is... <laughs> Glacier on a Hot Tin Roof. That's mm -hmm. a great way to put this. Mm -hmm. So I will be speaking as a character. You have to identify which glacier I am. Got Super. it? Super. Great. Are you ready? Nope. <laughs> Here we go. Or the first one. I've done it, Cliff. I got out. I came down from the mountain and I never looked back. 
I found myself some flat land and I live there now forever. I've covered that land with every last inch of myself. It's like I'm a giant circle covering the dirt cliff and I'm bigger. I'm bigger now than I ever was with you, Cliff. What is a Piedmont Glacier? That is correct. That is correct. That is a Piedmont Glacier. Um, please write a play <laughs> about as glaciers. Uh, yes, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. For, for the yeah. next one. And Here produce it for children Great. so they understand the despair. I can't do this any longer, Biff. Standing here looking out into the ocean, longing for something more. Every time I stand here, it's like a part of myself falls into the vast ocean and I'll never be able to get it back. What is an ice shelf? Oh, glacier? incorrect. Incorrect. There's a type of glacier that feeds right into an ocean. What is a freshwater glacier? Technically, it would have been a freshwater glacier, but if it's feeding into an ocean, they call it a tidewater glacier. Tidewater glacier. The other Got one. It. There you go. But it could be an ice shelf, right? An ice shelf is when an ice sheet sits, extends, on extends the ocean. over Got water. It. Okay. Yeah. So, okay, great. I was in the neighborhood. Close. The next one. Don't you ever speak to me like that again, you no-necked monster. Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what I am? You will never get through me. My temper is a miles thick. And my strength covers giant swaths of the earth. You will never get through me. What is a nice sheet? That is correct. There we go. What is a nice sheet? Okay, the next one. <laughs> swaths of the earth. <laughs> Don't you dare try and stop me. I've lived up in this mountain for too long. I'm moving on, Tom. My dreams can never be contained here. I'm flowing. I'm moving into long stretches of land between these peaks you called a home. I will never be contained. What is a valley glacier? That is correct. (laughs) (laughs) And finally. God. Stanley. I wanted out of here the day you turned your eyes from me and to that bottle of liquor. (laughs) You were my solid ground. I have tried so many times to walk out, to get out and leave you and all of this behind. But every time it's like you are still with me, wrapped up inside of me, you and your problems, you and your secrets, all entangled up inside of me like I can never escape. What is a rock glacier? That is correct. Look at that. Because the rocks are all entangled up inside. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, girl, you better know your uh, types of glaciers or, based on these monologues in the style of Tennessee Williams. Or glacier on a hot tin roof. Or glacier on a hot tin roof. Right. A street glacier named Desire. <laughs> <laughs> the sources for today's trail mix include the United States Geological Survey, NASA, and the Alaska Satellite Facility, the National Snow and Ice Data Center, National Geographic, the World Wildlife Fund, and the National Park Service. This has been Trail Mix by Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast, and we're here to remind you to glacier early and glacier often. And that glacing <laughs> is always out there. <laughs> And we're here to remind you to hike early and hike often, and that adventure is always out there. Gaze at the National Parks was created and is hosted by us, Dustin Ballard and Michael Ryan. To see images from this episode, follow our Instagram at Gaze at the National Parks. To contact us, email us at gaze at the National Parks at gmail.com. And to find out more about the parks visited on the show, visit our website, gaze at the National Parks.com. And to buy some of our merch, go to the Gay Shop by going to shop.gaze at the National Parks.com. And that's Gaze, G A Z E. All original artwork featured on Instagram, on our website, and in the Gay Shop is by me, Michael Ryan. All original music was written by Dave Seaman and performed by Dave Seaman, Mariella Klinger, and Sean Sklios. Our music producer is Skylar Fordgang. This episode was edited by me, Dustin Ballard. We would also like to acknowledge that while recording this episode, we were on the traditional and stolen lands of the Lenape people, also known as Ocean County, New Jersey. In 2018, the American Meteorological... The American Meteoro... Meteorological... Ooh, that's a tough one. The American Meteorological... Is that right? Meteorological. Okay. It's, if you say meteora, 
and then logical. Okay. The American Meteorological Society. Okay, but say it like one word now. <laughs> <laughs> this is blooper material. Uh-huh.